Hi, right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Strategy and Resources Scrutiny Board. Um, I'm really excited about the programme we have for this municipal year, so hopefully you'll um, be able to feed into it a bit towards the end of this agenda for any, anything else that you want to discuss this year. Um, I'd also just like to say, unfortunately, Neil Evans can't attend. He's got a doctor's appointment, so I'd like to send him our best wishes. Um, and we'll start with some introductions. I think it'd be quite helpful is if we go around the table, I'd like you to introduce yourself. I'd like you to say, if you're a councillor, what ward you represent and when you first got elected. Um, so I'm Andrew Scopes, I'm a councillor for the Beeston and Holbeck Ward. I chair this board and I was first elected in 2018. I'll go over to Councillor Lennox. Morning, I'm Councillor Jess Lennox. I'm a councillor for Crossgates and Winmore Ward. I'm substituting for another member on this board today and I was also first elected in 2018. Councillor Karen Renshaw from Asley and Robin Hood, first elected in 2004 and I'm substituting for somebody on this board today. Thank you. Hello everyone, Councillor Peter Carlyle from Carvelin Farsley Ward. Uh, I was first elected in 2018. It's Councillor Mahalia France Mayor, and I was um, for Mall Town Ward, and I was elected in May 2022. Morning, everyone. Councillor Kevin Ritchie, Bramley and Stanley Ward, elected in 2014. Councillor Sharon Burke, Middleton Park Ward, elected uh, May 21. Good morning, Tim Rollett from the Council's Intelligence and Policy Service and my team uh, has responsibility for corporate risk management, corporate performance management and business continuity. I'm Victoria Bradshaw, I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Council, um, Section 151 and uh, I'm responsible for financial services. Thank you. Morning everybody, I'm Councillor Deborah Cooper, I'm the Executive Board Member for Resources uh, and Community Safety, um, and I was the first elected in 2003. <laughs> uh, Kieran Denner, Head of Procurement and Commercial Services. Uh, good morning, Billy Flynn, uh, Councillor for Adler Wharfdale Ward, elected at the same time as Kevin, uh, 2014, and I'm feeling rather lonely over here if somebody wants to come and join me. No? Oh. Becky Atherton, Principal Scrutiny Advisor. Great, thank you very much. Welcome to today's meeting. I'm going to just pass over to Becky for the first uh, few items. Morning all. Uh, item number one, appeals. There are no appeals against refusals of inspection documents. Item number two, exclusions of the public. There are no items excluded from the public domain. Uh, item three, late items. There are no late items. Item four, declarations of interest. Can I ask members to disclose any interests in accordance with Leeds City Council's Code of Conduct? I will take silence as none. Um, apologies, item number five. Apologies have been received from Councillor Caroline Gruen, Councillor Renshaw is substituting, Councillor Camilla McSood, Councillor Lennox is substituting, and Councillor Chapman has asked that it be noted that unfortunately she's tested positive for COVID and therefore can't attend today. Um, in addition, Councillors Pryor, Harland and Lewis have sent apologies for the item on performance, and Aaron Linden has sent apologies for the performance item also. Um, in addition, Councillor Scopes has obviously already mentioned Neil Evans sent his apologies. Thank you very much. And I understand Councillor Firth is coming, but is running late. OK, so we're going to move on to the minutes. I'll take any matters of accuracy first. Any matters of accuracy? I don't see anyone commenting. So we'll move on to matters of rising. Becky? Um, a number of matters arising. Minute number 71 and minute number 72. Just to note that the board's request for Leeds 2023 to come back in this municipal year has been reflected in your draft work programme. 
uh, minute 72. Again, the consideration of the future of waste services in Leeds has been um, scheduled in your draft work programme, which will be discussed later in the meeting. And the same for minute 74, the list of items which the previous board put forward as suggestions for this year have all been accommodated and will be um, discussed later in the meeting. Thank you very much, Becky. Is there any other matters arising that members want to raise? No. Okay, so move on to item seven. So item seven and eight are sort of formal uh, points that we have each year at the start of the municipal year. So we'll start with item seven, which is the terms of reference. Okay, Becky. And um, the terms of reference report puts out puts um, forward the board's terms as agreed by council at the AGM on the 26th of May this year. Should there be any changes to those terms of reference, the board will be advised during the municipal year. It's just to note at this stage. Um, I understand that there's, there's one item that could, could change. Can you just comment on that, please? It's been suggested that Civic Enterprise Leeds is moved from um, the Environment, Housing and Communities Board, where it currently sits, to sit within the remit of this board for a bit more consistency with the director's functions. Thanks, Becky. If, if it does move across, I don't know if we need to do something formal, but if we do, that will happen. And then we'll obviously uh, also scrutinise that aspect. I think I'll be quite interested in looking at the enterprise management Okay, and then let's move on to, unless anyone's got any comments on this one. No, okay, item eight. So item eight is um, about cooperative members. I'm sure you've read the paper. Previous years, we haven't had a cooperative member in this board, but I feel like we should just leave it as an option in case we need it at some point in the future. Any objections or comments on that? No, okay, great, thank you. We'll move on to agenda item nine, which is um, financial outturn. And so I'll hand over to Victoria. Victoria, as, as usual, assume we've all read our papers, but if there's anything you particularly want to highlight, please uh, do mention that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. These are um, two reports that are presented as one with the financial and treasury management outturn reports. They'll be considered by executive board on Wednesday. Um, the position has been reported throughout the year to executive board and scrutinised in this committee throughout um, the last financial year. Um, the position um, is that we've got a net underspend of 1.5 million. However, that is after we've had an overspend relating to COVID of 27.8 million. Um, the housing revenue account has um, got net um, overspend of 2.6 million. However, that um, will be managed through reserves. The report also covers um, some new reserves that are, are being asked of exec board to be um, created um, from the 1st of um, April this year. And then um, it also details the capital programme and the collection fund. On the treasury management report, um, this report goes into detail about um, the treasury management functions, about the levels of debt, um, and there are no issues around us staying within our operational or authorised limits. I would say that interest rates last week went up again, as you'll be aware, so that's five consecutive increases, and we're now at 1.25%, so that's just an update on that report. Um, we have locked in um, all the short term borrowing now on long term, and we did that before um, the interest rates have started to rise. But obviously, there is a risk this year that as we undertake the capital programme, as interest rates increase, that the cost of borrowing will um, increase as well. But we are looking for opportunities, as we have done um, in the last couple of years, around locking in on those longer term uh, rates to, to uh, obtain some um, some security and uh, make sure that the budget's sustainable. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Victor. And I'd just like um, to say thanks to your, you and your team. I know it's been a difficult year and um, sort of rigorous financial management is really important to the uh, running of the city. So if you pass on my thanks, that'd be appreciated. Councillor Cooper, do you want to comment before I open for questions? Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I think um, that, that I wanted to say thank you to Victoria and her team um, for uh, the management of our, what are our accounts, which I, um, 
in these really difficult and challenging circumstances with um, all costs uh, increasing in terms of energy and materials and uh, and so many other things, um, it's really difficult to continue to forecast um, um, accurately forward. But I think um, to get uh, a budget of the size of ours to within one and a half million pounds um, is pretty amazing. So I want to thank you and the team. Please take that um, back to the team as well, if you will. Thank you. I don't have anything else to say. We'll work for questions, Chair. Thank you. Has, have members got any questions on this report? Yeah, C Councillor Ritchie. Yeah, thank you. Um, really interesting report and uh, a good bit of work. I know from my time at corporate governance, the, the effort and what have you that goes into producing the budget. So very good. <clears throat> the question I've got, and I know it kind of stretches into another uh, scrutiny board's actual work but on page 20 but it does affect this scrutiny board hence it's in the report the disrepair cases um, there was a real um, and that's effect on the budget a few years a couple of years maybe three years ago well, pre-covid there was certainly an effort um, under Simon's Costigan's leadership to get on the front foot with the uh, disrepair claims I just wondered if that's still in process and how we're getting on with that really because um obviously that's quite a significant spend and i know through casework that we, there may be some slippage so that's that's you want all my questions together got about three i think yes please councillor chair uh page 25 i'm looking at the uh, table of the capital program i just wondered why there's a predicted in increase in borrowing for 22 23 um it seems to be a bit of a jump from 151 then then it drops down again so if you know about that and then finally and i think it'll help all members on page 65 the ward based initiative funding table just wondered if it's possible it may need to come in a paper separately how how that's distributed because there's a big variation in the allocations across the ward and um, I, I can't, don't know exactly why, and I'm sure new members would welcome that information as well. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ritchie. I hand over to Victoria. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I'm just um, looking at the um, pages because it's different in my pack. Just on the HRA and the district repairs it is a priority but there has been um delays due to the covid and staffing etc but um i do understand that that work is still ongoing and is a priority um with the increase in borrowing can you just tell me on the page was it on page 26 you were you were saying on my packet which was supplementary it's on page 20 um let me... is it no no hang on <clears throat> 25, sorry. On the section seven capital program. So this is this is to do with the um future out outturn positions and the forecast levels of borrowing um going forward. And your question was around why the borrowing had dropped in 23-24. Um oh, why is it going up really in first one in 22-23? So that reflects the level of the, the programme. So um, detailed in the appendix is the, um, the programme that's been undertaken. I think it's in appendix five. Um, and that will show the, dif the different elements of the capital programme. And as that was in the programme was larger in 22, 23, that would show the increase in borrowing. And then in future years, as you can see, it's it's up and down and, and that's on that basis. So it's how we fund the capital program. I can it's I can have a look and um, get the details of which schemes were are going to be funded by the prudential borrowing if that would help. Yeah, okay. And then on your final question, sorry, that was to do with the Treasury Management Report. Was it on page 68, did you say? 65, the World Base Initiative. And um, what was your question around that, Councillor? 
So it's the variation in and um, the allocations to the wards. There's, there's some big jumps. So how is the ward base initiative distributed? Basically. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to come back to you that on that, Councillor Richie. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Yes, if I can um, just um, add to what Victoria said um, about the disrepair uh, costs and how things are um, a, a bit uh, going on at the moment. Um, as you mentioned, they are under another scrutiny. They're also under another exec board member uh, now, but it, it did used to be me, so I know some uh some things about it and also i was up at c up at um, lbs on last thursday for a visit and they were telling me the work that they were uh, that were undertaking to try and um mitigate some of the issues around disrepair uh they have um had um issues through working um under covid conditions um as you can imagine over a couple of years um, and now that um, we've come out of all of those restrictions, they are playing catch up a little bit with a number of uh, repairs, um, but they've got an action plan in place. Um, and I'm sure they'll be reporting it to the other scrutiny. I, I would imagine that you'd be able to get um, copies of that um, action plan uh, for this uh, scrutiny members if they're interested um, in that as well. But that, that the priority of bringing the amount of disrepair claims down that quite rightly you mentioned that Simon started is still um, in place and action is still being taken on that. So um, I'm sure that can be reported as well. But I just thought I'd add that bit because I, I visited him last week. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Councillor Cooper. And we'll note, we'll ask uh, Becky to find the action plan and send it round board members. I think that'd be helpful. Thanks for that question, uh, Councillor Ritchie. Okay, I'm gonna move to uh, Councillor Flynn, please. Thank you. Um, a quick word of thanks again, Victoria, for, for the work over the last sort of couple of years and, and, and every year, of course, but uh, in particular, the um, uh, Eve Roothouse and, and Phil Cole and their uh, crowd with the COVID related grants, they've been, uh, I think, go over and above the last couple of years to sort of get everything out on time, pretty much spent every penny, I would think, you know, so uh, very grateful indeed. Um, just a couple of things. The although we had a balanced budget this year, and we're looking to achieve a balanced budget next year, um, the picture isn't quite so rosy within the individual directorates, which is not an issue for for Victoria or even uh, Debbie. Um, but the one in particular we're looking at is children and families, where um, there was a considerable un, uh, overspend um, for very understandable reasons uh, related to children looked after. Uh, both inside the city and outside, uh, and also um, associated costs for children uh, who aren't um, actually looked after or, or just over the uh, over the age of being looked after, but still um, have a considerable impact on the council sort of resources. It's just something I think we need to look at for the next couple of years, because um, I, I know there are plans in place uh, to uh, address uh, the overspend, uh, but they're not in the same happy position, I think, as uh, the other two fairly largely overspent ones, um, city development and uh, communities, where the lost income, I think, for the last year or two is likely to recover. So it's just something I think we need to to watch. Uh, and, and in addition to that, um, uh, you'll know I've, I've mentioned uh, the strategic views and um, business as usual budget plans uh, over the last couple of years or so. Um, strategic reviews do come for scrutiny. The BAUs do not. Uh, and I just think it's an area we need to look very, very closely at or keep an eye on over the next sort of 12 months or so, because although we're likely to budget, um, balance the budget next year, um, the third year, I think, is uh, is going to be rather more interesting. So thanks very much, Victoria. Thanks, Councillor. And in terms of um, children and family stuff, I think I'll ask Becky just to check out what exactly the the Children and Family Scrutiny Board is looking at, because um, what we I know you don't like a replication of works. So we just make sure that we are doing our bit. Um, but I take your point in terms of the budget does need to be to be watched really closely. Victoria, did you want to comment on Councillor Flynn's point around business as usual items? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, the business as usual items are those that the services and directorates um, would do as part of normal business decisions and therefore they take those decisions um, throughout the year and that's why they don't come for scrutiny, it's part of running a service. 
um, the service proposals that have the savings proposals that have an impact on service delivery from a point of view of um, staffing implications or implications um, on the communities. Those are the ones where um, we go to executive board and then to full council for approval on those. And that's why they come to scrutiny. And that, and that is the difference between the two. Thank you. Thanks, Lefren. Uh, thanks, Victoria. This, this is named at, at Victoria, but I, I sometimes find it quite difficult to draw a distinction between strategic views and business as usual. Um, simple question is, if business as usual, why were we doing it in the first place if we don't have to sort of do it now? It, it's just really, I think, that the scrutiny boards need to, to have a, a, a much closer look than perhaps we've done in the past at BAU savings um, to, and of course they're not coming to us, that, that's that's the problem. But they should be, I think, are they usually on executive board papers? No, the, the business as usual is not an executive board decision, because as I said, they're, they're delegated down to the um, budget holders as part of their normal delivery of a service. Um, and the things, the things around where, um, they might be able to make um, inflationary um, reductions. They might be able to look at the demand of those services that the, that the resources aren't required. So it's part of the day to day. So we, it's not an executive board decision and therefore it wouldn't come here. Um, the ones, as I've said, which are where they go out for consultation are those that do go to executive board and then are scrutinised. Otherwise, we'd just be inundated with the number of decisions that mem that officers take as part of their day to day running of the service. And that's why we have this scheme of delegation. Um, just in terms of the business as usual, when we're doing financial monitoring, your progress against your business as usual work, that's that would be highlighted if you, you weren't achieving those targets, wouldn't it? If on in the action plans that um, supplement the financial health report, we do we do monitor where we are on the um, savings proposals. Um, but the business as usual ones are, are already taken through the decisions of the of officers. Yeah, I, I did put on fortune of Victoria because they're always in your papers, but uh, they're, they're rarely anywhere else. Um, and that, that was the point I was making, I suppose. Um, they, they're front and centre when we get the financial monitoring reports every month, which is where I pick them up. Um, but other than that, you've really got to dig deep to sort of find out where they are. So it's just, a, I suppose, a, a marker for us. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Flynn. Any other questions or comments on this paper? I can't see anyone else commenting. I just, um, I'm really conscious that um, the current inflationary environment is quite material to the budget this year because it's so high but also over the particularly more so even more so over the medium term and so i've asked victoria and she's agreed to give us a training session on inflation and the impact of inflation and that's been put in the diaries for the 4th of july and i think it's really important for us to if we can attend that training because as we're monitoring the budget understanding how serious the inflation impact is is really important um, and, and sometimes the imp impact won't be necessarily when you expect, so for example, on the energy prices, uh, Victoria's team had very shrewdly locked us in until the end of September, which I think is as far as she could. Um, so the inflationary impact of fuel, for example, or heating our buildings won't hit until September, even though for us, as a, certainly for me as a household, it's, uh, it's already hitting me. So I, I think that sort of, that training is going to be really valuable and that's going to help us challenge the budget um so thanks for that victoria and I encourage people to come um councillor uh firth i can see you want to ask a question I'll, I'll allow it um okay thank you chair and apologies to all of the committee for being late this morning councillor firth for the harewood ward um uh, the reason I come in was to that same issue. Obviously, interest rates are currently at 1.25%, and it's indicated by the Bank of England that they're very, very likely to rise going forward. Obviously, at the moment, there is an underspend of about 1.5 million on the revenue budget. Would it not be financially wise to potentially allocate that to the General Reserve to use, should we have to then be having to use further funds in the future to stabilise and mitigate the impact of inflation going forward? Yeah. All yeah. oh, right. Thank you. Given it's a public meeting, 
Um, and everyone might have heard Councillor Flynn's response to Councillor Firth. Can you just state it? That's fine, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Yes, please. Victoria. Um, thank you, Chair. The, um, the, the underspend will go into general fund balances. Um, it drops in as part of the account enclosure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's always the risk that uh, inf inflation is going to be, we've got a big budget, one and a half million. Um, it sounds like a lot of money, but one half a billion, it's maybe not such a big percentage. Okay, I'm going to move on to item 10. Thank you very much, Victoria, for that. Um, just uh, so item 10, I'm going to pass over to Tim to present the paper. As, as you know, Tim, we always assume everyone's read the papers, but if there's anything particular you want to draw out, please feel free to do that. That's right. Thank you, Chair. So this is our, our twice yearly performance report. Uh, we go in June and January usually, and the results uh, have been through the respective directorate management teams for check and challenge. And then they will flow into what we call the annual performance report, which goes to executive board at the end of next month. <clears throat> um, these are the high level results uh, with a bit of analysis. And I've got colleagues from finance, procurement, and HR to assist with any uh, technical queries, uh, should there be any. Uh, but the results also act as a signpost for any further work that members of the board might wish to uh, undertake. And I know uh, we've got culture on the agenda for a future board meeting, which obviously is covered by a couple of the performance indicators here. It's also worth pointing out that uh, these performance indicators underpin what was known as the best council plan, which was a council strategy. And the best council plan recently was superseded by the best city ambition. And obviously, as part of that changeover, um, we're reviewing all the performance indicators to make sure they're still aligned to that new strategy, that we're reporting the right things to the right people. And my team, in conjunction with services and directorates, are currently refreshing those performance indicators. We will be meeting with the chairs of the scrutiny boards to discuss um, what we're planning on reporting going forwards and also the sort of format and depth of, of that information. So next time you see the report in January, there might be some slightly different performance indicators there. So um, the only other thing that I, I've got to add is that um, performance indicators for statutory requests for um, information management um, are, are currently showing an ongoing concern. And Aaron Linden, who's given his apologies, has provided me with a bit more further information around some of the work that's going on to address those concerns. So they've broken the process down into two uh, sides. The first side being from the receipt of the uh, information request from a member of the public, uh, sending it out to the director and collecting it back. And then a second phase, which is from the receipt in IDS of the um, uh, the response from the service to getting that out to the members of the public and then dealing with any follow-up queries. So there's a number of changes that are going on there around those two phases. And I gather Aaron is due to meet with Councillor Scopes later this week for a more in-depth discussion on that. So although results aren't particularly great in that area, I understand there's a lot of ongoing work around that. So I'll, I'll pause right now, and myself and colleagues are now happy to take your questions on the performance results. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, I have to start with Councillor Carlyle. Thank you. Um, I've got a few points I'll just look at. They, they may be ones um, that require additional information later on. Um, so just a, a few little bits that that hit me off the report first as a former director in one of the creative industries in Leeds the figures for uh, the decrease in the number of employees in the creative industry in Leeds is is um well it's tragic on the report really we know why that is because obviously the report is from uh, the latest reporting figures from 2020 but I wondered um two questions on that one obviously we haven't got the figures for 2021 yet on that um, but are we aware of how much of that we believe may be temporary? So maybe people that were unable to work in the creative industries in 2020. However, now there has been a, a re-recruiting to those posts. Um, the second was obviously I noted Leeds is a, a hub for creative industries in the in the country, and it, it it's a great pride that we have in our city. But um, Birmingham was the only one that seemed to buck that trend, and I just wondered if we knew 
what they'd done differently. I noticed they're similar across many comparable um, authorities, but Birmingham seemed to have bucked that trend and, and whether we had an idea. So that's my first point on that. I'll, I'll, I'll then go to the other figures. Um, the figure about the uh, gender pay gap, gender pay gap is, is promising because we've achieved the target as of the latest figures of, of March 2021. So that's really positive. Um, and we've also got the um, uh, the percentages for the amount of women employed in, in the council as a whole, um, which there's been... Uh, some progress on but there's still some some challenges there one of the questions i think i'd raised previously was i'm very sure that will change among different directorates and will be very different and i think when we're looking at the general figures here for how many women employed in different services that 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 uh, gives us an overall but i'm sure across directorates we will see huge changes and i'm more interested in what we're doing there because i think it's it's making sure that we have um a workforce that represents the city in every single directorate and service that, that uh, why we have the figure there. So I wondered whether we could look at breaking that down um, by directorate or, or by type of employment or something that would give us that, that relevance. Um, I think that's it for now, Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Yes, those are very good points. And in terms of the, the cultural ones, um, I'll have to find out whether there's any more um, detailed analysis about um, the temporary and permanent nature of that um, and why Birmingham have been, have been booking that trend. Um, there's normally a fire alarm at this time, board, so we'll just uh, hopefully wait a few seconds and it'll stop and I'll pass back to Tim. Okay, yes, it definitely was a drill. Um, okay, back to you, Tim. Uh, that's right. So um, in terms of the cultural queries, I will find those out. And obviously, we're aware that there's a cultural report coming to this committee, I believe, next time. So we can get those answers uh, in time for that, if not before. And then just before I, I pass over to uh, Andy Dodman, who's the Chief Officer from HR um, on the gender pay gap queries, um, we are looking at the, the format of the performance report that we bring to uh, the scrutiny board. So um, if we can get that further detailed breakdown across the directorates, next time would be the ideal time to introduce that. So it's quite quite a timely query, but I'll, I'll just hand over to Andy um, if he's got anything else to add. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm Andy from the uh, HR team. Um, your point is absolutely right about the gender pay gap. So it is good news that it's going down and it's hit the target. Um, but you're also right that it's obviously a, an aggregated council-wide figure. And obviously, when you drill down by service, by role, by demographic, the figures obviously do vary quite significantly. So I think it probably is prudent to um, drill down and look at that granular level of detail, because sometimes our action, our response has to vary depending on that um, variability. So we do look at that more detailed analysis by service and by grade and by role, but we're very happy to come back and share that with you. And then we can apply the particular actions that we're taking to offer you some assurance on that. Thank you. Thank you, Andy and Tim. Do you have a follow-up question, Councillor Carlyle? No, that sounds good. I, I knew there'd be ones we'd need to see the further detail. I might bring them up when we're talking about the work programme for, for the year. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Burke. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I ask about the um, couple of questions, really, if I may? The appointment of the head of HR projects and with particular focus on diversity. Can I ask what the freedom to speak up guardian, because it's a, a lovely term, isn't it? But could you put some meat onto the bones, what that will actually do, that role? Um, and, and what the plans are, because we've got the five headings, recruitment, progression, training, data and monitoring obviously don't require an answer. But I just wondered what depth there would be around the other things. My other questions, nothing to do with that, incidentally. It's about the levy payments and the reduced starts around apprenticeships. So obviously, with you can only roll over within that 12-month period. So I assume 
that there's been a loss, and I've got that in inverted commas because they just take it away, don't the government? I wonder if we knew what impact that had had, how much that would be, the actual uh, loss of funding, and what what strategies are in place to make sure that we don't lose any more levy payments needlessly. Um, and around staff sickness, again, you have a new new post that's going to look at that and monitor it. And I note that mental health, uh, people reporting that they have a mental health difficulty is by way far the highest uh, reason for staff sickness. So what will that post actually do? Because it doesn't go into detail, does it? It mentions that's a post that's going to look at sickness across the board. But I just wonder, that's, that's incredibly high, isn't it? 34% is incredibly high. Thank you. Thank you. So um, lots of questions there. So I'll start with the um, diversity question you asked. So you are right that we uh, have appointed a new Freedom to Speak Up guardian. Um, that individual is not in post yet, but hopefully will start over the next month or so. It's a fairly well-established post in the NHS. Um, and we spent a bit of time with our local NHS trust to understand how their role has operated. And then we made the decision to um, mirror that here in the council. And we will be the first council in the country to have a Freedom to Speak Up guardian, which I think is a really positive initiative. Uh, in a nutshell, what the role does is it provides a safe space for individuals to express any concern that they may witness or may experience as a member of staff, either through colleagues around them or equally in any kind of service provision. Uh, and this is where predominantly came from the NHS in terms of a, a place where individuals could um, really express those concerns rather than having to go through, say, the same line management process or equally to the HR team or to a trade union colleague. So it was the opportunity to go somewhere else. And the idea with The Guardian is that they would have very strong relationships with the most senior leadership in the organisation so they could flag things quickly and effectively to try to get to the, the heart and the root of the difficulty. So obviously we're, we're not yet... Um, got that individual in post, so it's, it's difficult to, to give you an assessment as to how successful it will be, but we are hoping that it, it becomes so. In addition to that, you rightly mentioned about the new temporary role that we've created, which is our uh, head of HR for diversity. And that role very much is to drive forward that uh, very broad diversity agenda that we've really stepped up over the last two years, really. So um, part of the work that that individual, myself and the wider team are doing is focusing on those five pillars that you've rightly mentioned. Because when we spent a lot of time talking about diversity, there's so much on that agenda. Um, and there's a lot of particular actions and um, issues to deal with. What we've really tried to do with our staff networks, our trade unions and our staff is focus on those five things and just land them and, and deliver them quickly. So there is an action plan that sits below those five issues, um, which of course you can see and, and we can share with you. Um, and it does drill down to fair bit of detail with timescale. So we're very happy to share that and hopefully that will answer that issue. You rightly mentioned about apprenticeships. Um, you are right that because of the um, short fall in the number, then there is an issue that some of the levy um, being returned. Um, and we can share those figures with you. Uh, I don't have them to hand, but we'll certainly will provide those with you. What we're trying to do at the moment is a number of two things really to remedy. So the first thing is rather than give the money back, we're trying to share that levy with other employers in the city so they can take advantage of that because it's better they can use that to create apprenticeships in other neighbouring partner organisations or other employers rather than, than, than return it. But obviously the second thing is obviously make sure that we are spending that levy appropriately. I think because of COVID and I think because of other initiatives that have come on at the same time, like the kickstart or the T-levels, obviously our focus has been um, spread quite thinly. So we will get back onto that um, apprenticeships and, and um, really focus very much on broadening the apprenticeship uh, route over the next year or so. Um, final thing you mentioned about sickness absence, uh, you are right that the mental health um, sickness absence figures are high. They're the highest reason for sickness absence. That's not new, but we have seen that increase over the last two years. And I'm sure that's in part because of the COVID effect. 
but obviously other anxieties that people are having, whether that's workload pressures, cost of living, all sorts of pressures and anxieties that people are facing in their daily lives. Um, what we're trying to do is obviously is focus our response very much along those lines. So as you say, what we are doing is sort of focusing our own HR resource very much in terms of um, supporting and targeting intervention. Because similar to the gender pay gap, when you drill down to the details, the figures are very sporadic. So um, mental health, ill health or sickness substance is very low in some areas. Um, and what we've always done is had a fairly generic um, constant support. So we've now changed that so we can focus and redirect our resource in those areas where it's highest and more problematic. So we're now beginning to co-locate some of our HR support, whether that's occupational health, counselling support, as well as more direct HR support in those areas where we think it's, it's more pertinent, where those figures are higher. Um, fairly early days, so we've only launched that about four, five, six months ago, but we are seeing that targeted intervention really helping. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Burke, do you want to go back on any of that? Thank you. Um, I think it'd be really useful for us to um, have a look at that action plan, if that's okay, around recruitment progression and, and the rest of it. Um, again, around the, the levy payments, I think it'd be interesting, again, if with Chair's blessing, for us to have a look how that levy sharing, because I think that's exactly the right thing to do, um, because there's some smaller organisations who could perhaps benefit and we could move people into employment, so I think that's great. Um, around the mental health as well, I'd be interested to have a look, if it's possible, how it's affecting um, different groups by gender um, and, and all the other categories. I don't know if that's possible, but I'd welcome that. Thank you. Yeah, we can certainly do that analysis. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So I think in first instance, I'll ask for that to be circulated around the board and then we'll see if it's um, if, uh, if we need to look at it further. OK, I'm going to bring in uh, Councillor Ritchie next. Thanks, Chair. Um, mine's just a simple question, I hope. Um, just on the summary of the Council's workforce profile and that ambition that we reflect our communities, I wondered if there was any citywide workforce population to compare. So we employ, for example, 6% of disabled people as the context in this 2011 census, which is helpful in terms of 75% um, of residents have a condition which leads them to be economically inactive. But how does that compare with the citywide workforce? And, you know, that throughout the categories, I'd, I'd be interested to, to have that data, I know it mean an extra column on your table, but if the data is available. I, I think probably in part it is. I, I think it's gathering the comparable data with other employers in the city. So there are a number of routes that we can do. So as you know, we work very closely with our anchor institutions across the city. And we've done a lot of work over the last six months of trying to standardise the way that we report on things like representation, diversity, sickness, we've already talked about, well-being, those are the metrics. So we're largely there, so we can now do that comparison to our anchors, which is a good 60,000, 70,000 staff that we employ across the city when you add up all of those different anchors. We're building relationships with other sectors, so the commercial sector, professional services, but that's just harder to get to. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't try. Um, and then you'll have a, a, a stronger comparison between ourselves and other big employers in the city. Thank you. I think that'd be very interesting. Okay, I'm going to be in Councillor Firth next. Thank you very much, Chair. I wanted to ask um, further to the discussion about the Freedom to Speak at Guardian. Um, the one concern I do have is obviously the significant drop in the response time in relation to FOI requests over the previous 12 months, whereby despite the fact that the number has dropped in the amount that the council is receiving, our actual response has still dropped further. Can you please confirm what we're doing as a council to make sure that we emphasise across the board that we are a transparent organisation to members of the public just as much as our own organisation? Thank you, Chair. 
Thanks, Councillor Hirth. That's, that's a, a good point there. And this is the, the work that the IDS and Aaron and his team are partly underway with. And, and like I say, there's a, a more detailed response uh, coming to councillor scopes later this week uh, aaron has provided me some information around um the work that they're doing on this um it's been split into two phases so phase one is um as i mentioned earlier on about the request from the information or the request being received in the council um to it going out to the director and then making its way back to to ids and um from a, a brief update that aaron has given me um, he's been looking at how to make efficiencies in the process and, and streamline it so there's not too many people getting involved um, and to make that more uh, effective. Um, the second part of the work that he's doing is phase two, which is the second side from when IDS get the response back from the respective service to issuing that response to um, the person that's made it and then any follow up work afterwards. Um, and that, that phase two work starts at the end of July. So um, we can get a more detailed response from uh, Aaron and his team about how that work is going. But it's clearly something that they've recognised. And Aaron has come in and had a look at this and, and identified some um, uh, ways in which that process can be made uh, more efficient and effective. Thanks, Tim. Uh, just um, as you know, my my bent on this is around um, automation, which obviously can make things quicker. Just to reassure Councillor Perth, it's already in the, the work programme in February. Um, but if you've got a follow up question you want to ask. Thank you, Chair, and, and I'm very glad to hear that it's been scheduled in, although February is a, a long time away, and I hope there would be some progress by then, because obviously at the time, uh, with the target of 90% to have dropped from 86% to 75%, despite the fact the number has dropped in terms of EIRs and also FOIs, uh, that's certainly something that uh, I think we need to emphasise across the board in terms of transparency. Um, just moving on to a separate issue in terms of uh, performance about procurement, um, it also notes, obviously, I appreciate the council and is competing in a very competitive market at the moment and also trying to get value for money for taxpayers. But the uh, maximising the local supplier spend has dropped by 2%. So it's dropped even further to 52%. Uh, whereas at the same time, the amount of SMEs that are procured for work has increased by 6%. But can you confirm what we're doing to make sure that we are emphasising the Leeds pound and how much work we can do here to improve that going forward? But I do appreciate we are emerging still from the pandemic, as some would have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Perth. Have you got other questions you want to ask? Not at the moment, Chair, and those are the only two. Thank, Thank you. you. Tim? Thanks. So in, in terms of the, um, just, just to sort of finish off on the, the previous question around um, the information management, I also noticed that there's a new uh, IT system being introduced, which should make the process more effective as well. So that's part way through implementation. Um, in terms of the, um, the procurement figures, I don't have the answers to hand, but I, I can find out. But if there's any colleagues here from procurement that want to uh, step in, yeah, Kieran's here. Um, Kieran, is this going to be covered in the next item anyway? Uh, no, I don't think it will be. I think it'll be a separate point in the next item. Um, so in terms of the information uh, that we've got with regard to, to spend, um, the system that, that, that we use in order to be able to, to, to gather that information, the financial management system uh, and the invoicing system, it takes a lot of manual processes to, to get the information from it. Uh, we work uh, each year to try and uh, improve uh, access to uh, more accurate information. So the sense that my colleagues get who, who are responsible for sort of data analytics in the team is that um, in terms of that drop, uh, it, well, it's a percentage drop as opposed to an actual drop in the, in the hard numbers. So <clears throat> spend with local uh, businesses has actually gone up albeit in comparison to the overall spend as a proportion, it's, it's, it's uh, marginally down. Uh, but the sense they get is that the uh, more accurate data that they're able to pull out of the systems at the moment is uh, part of the explanation for that. I think there'll be other things as well. We've, we've, we've had a lot of sort of large capital programs over the last uh, 12 months, 24 months. Uh, and we mentioned earlier about uh, spend uh, from children's and families 
um, that's um, sort of spend with um, providers have looked at uh, care for looked after children outside Leeds, which is uh, I think also gone up. So I think there are specific large areas of spend that have probably had some impact on that as well. But in terms of what we're doing, we will and we always do uh, look for opportunities uh, to to support local businesses to be able to um, to uh, tender for council contracts. We're currently in the process of um, looking to call off from uh, a Crown Commercial Services. So that's the government commercial frameworks that are available uh, for what's described as tail spend. Uh, so these are the sort of large volume in terms of numbers, but, but relatively low value in terms of the actual overall spend. Um, they've got some frameworks in place where you can actually um, make sure that local suppliers um, are contracting with the the, the, the overall uh, framework provider and, and, and they essentially provide uh, an app almost like a, a, an Amazon marketplace or something like that, but you can make sure that local suppliers are on there um, so that those low value areas of spend are being targeted at, at, at those local suppliers. So that's just one example of, the, of, of what we are doing to try and make sure that more spend is going through uh, local suppliers. Do you have a follow up question, Councillor Firth? I just wanted to ask a particular point, which is that when we next have the procurement item come up to us in particular, that we're able to analyse in detail, is there any way of actually getting more figures in terms of the applications coming from local suppliers and tenders um, to actually make sure that even if potentially we are not taking them up, are we actually receiving that interest in the first place? And is there something that this council could do to improve that going forward? Uh, but I, I think the, the only other comment I had was on a slightly separate note was very quickly, I know you asked me before, was that a previous issue that's been raised by this board in the previous financial year was in relation to the call wait times with the amount of customers trying to come through to us. Now, I appreciate the number of complaints has significantly decreased by about 150, but more than that. But the problem is, is that we actually have a wait time potentially of over 10 minutes for anyone still to get through to the customer contact centre. So is there any way of which we can, you can confirm how those complaints are sourced and whether that is potentially having an impact on the amount of complaints we receive. I would hope that it would be decreasing, but I am aware of other external factors, including the customer contact centre wait times, among others. Thank you, Chair. I just also comment that that's on our uh, the the customer um, the the procurement the the, fact, the figures you ask for the next procurement item. Obviously, it's the next item in this agenda, so it probably doesn't. It probably isn't going to be able to get them for the next uh, procurement item. Um, but next time we, we speak, I'm sure he's uh, made a note of that. And um, just to confirm, the contact centre is on the agenda for a future meeting. Um, and it's something that is is really important to get our heads around and improve the waiting time, as Neil, Neil Evans has come and said to us. But if you just want to comment in, that's OK. That's right. Just just to add to that, we mentioned that we're looking at the uh, a new refreshed set of key performance indicators, and obviously that um, general wait time will be one of the ones that we've we've picked out as would be useful to compile and report back to this board. So um, that will be in the report next time that we come. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Do you want to comment? Please, if I may, Chair, uh, thank you. Just to um, add to what officers have uh, responded to Councillor Firth on um, and um, that, that you've mentioned that it's coming to scrutiny, but there is um, improvement work um, being undertaken by officers at the moment to ensure that the contact centre is as efficient as it possibly can be um, to respond to our residents. Um, and, and lots of work has been ongoing. Many improvements have already been made, but we know we can make further improvements and, and that work's going to be ongoing throughout the year, Chair. So if you need updates uh, on that at your agenda items, um, you know, ensure that we ask officers to bring you the updates on the improvement work. Thank you very much, Councillor Cooper. OK, I'm going to bring Councillor Flynn next. Thanks, Andrew. Um, probably comments rather than questions, if that's OK. All right. Um, will uh, anyone from IDS be here next month? I'm just checking the agenda. Yes. I, I so my yes, not so. me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They're, they're usually invisible at these uh, uh, scrutiny boards. It, 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 just a couple of things about the um, 
uh, the figures that uh, they're quoting for the you know fixed at first point of contact and all the rest of it i'll leave that until until next month yeah. but my heart sinks when i hear yeah. new systems are going to be introduced um I, i've uh, been using computers i think for 25 years and i'd like to think that i'm not a lot ice but i am um and when people talk about robots and algorithms i've said it before and i'll say it again um you know when you're at the other end of the phone and you cannot get an answer um, I'm afraid it doesn't matter how efficient your service is or what your complaints up and down and all the rest of it are, uh, it, it just drives me up, up the wall. Um, and I have a fight with my laptop almost every day, and I'm not joking, over Microsoft 365 with the security issues that they've introduced. But I'm told, oh, it's nothing to do with us, it's 365. Well, of course, who introduced 365? Us. So it's, you just go round and round and round and round in a circle and you lose an enormous amount of time. Anyway, that's for next month. Um, the, the other one, just on contact centers, similarly, um, I'm not going to go on. We did talk about KPIs, um, which, well, from my perspective anyway, don't actually reflect the customer um, experience, if that's the right word nowadays. Um, it doesn't sort of reflect the number of people who don't get through. I mean, I've referred something to Jonathan Pry yesterday. There's been relatively simple inquiry about a um a refuse wagon knocking somebody's wing mirror off uh, quite honest they left a note on the windscreen there's not a problem with it um six months later uh, you try and get anybody in the council to understand what it's all about or to acknowledge that there's been an issue even when they've got the signature of the man who actually did the action to the first place so i'm not really interested in kpis i'm more interested in 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 how people out there feel that they're being dealt with rather than us being produced. These figures are being produced for us week in and week out. Uh, but it's a, it's a matter for another day, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question about how we, um, so key performance indicators are only any good if they give us actual feeling for what, what's happening. And given Tim's uh, looking at what indicators we get, I think it's a relevant comment. Um, and obviously I'll do my utmost to ensure that uh, uh it team are here next next month um well, I'll, I'll do i'll do my best thank you okay um i think everyone who wants to comment has commented um i think that's that's really interesting and we've got uh plenty of items uh to take forwards but i let councillor cooper do you want to comment well um unfortunately i'll have to leave for a, an 11 o'clock meeting chair so um uh, i'm going to withdraw at this point but can i just thank scrutiny members for all their comments um views and um and questions because it really does um inform us going forward to ensure that we get the right reports to you so it's good to see you all this morning Thank you very much, Councillor Cooper. Okay, going to move on to item number 11, the procurement update. Um, I think, Kieran, you're going to present this. Uh, please assume we've read the paper. If there's anything in particular you want to highlight, please do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the procurement update report focuses on the uh, terms and conditions that the Council uses for its uh, external uh, supplier contracts and how those are monitored. Uh, the report includes some background about the various procurement processes that uh, are in place uh, and that need to be followed depending on the actual sort of value and complexity of, of contracts. In terms of the terms and conditions that we are used, just to note that uh, the contract procedure rules require that the council standard terms and conditions are used. Uh, and we've got different versions of, of terms and conditions for goods and services. Um, we also have uh, a standard agreement uh, for contracts above £100,000 and then uh, more simple agreements for, for, for contracts below that value. Uh, for works contracts, we use an industry standard uh, NEC contract that we amend with a suite of uh, Leeds City Council specific amendments. Uh, but there are circumstances where we use other contracts. So, for example, if we're procuring off a framework agreement, we'll have to use uh, their terms and conditions. Uh, and exceptionally, we might uh, draft a bespoke contract or use another providers, uh, sorry, the suppliers own terms and conditions, uh, provided that they've been reviewed by uh, the legal team within procurement commercial services. Um, the report includes examples of uh, contractual levers that we have in the council's standard terms and conditions and that we typically expect in the contracts uh, that, that, that we use if they're non-standard uh, LCC contracts. 
And then in terms of uh, monitoring, uh, just to note, um, the current, well, the, the, the current position, the position that will continue is that chief officers are responsible for having contract management arrangements in place that are, that are appropriate for the contracts within the service areas. Uh, and good contract management obviously has a, a number of benefits in terms of delivering the outputs that, that, that we're expecting from the contract. It also uh, en encourages continuing innovation uh, 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 under the contract, helps identify savings, avoids unnecessary cost. And, and it, you know, active contract management can help avoid or deal with issues that, that, that might re uh, arise uh, more promptly. Um, there is research that says poor contract management can essentially cost 9% uh, of the contract value. So that's things like uh, lost opportunities under the contracts or uh, value that you've paid for, but outputs not received. Um, so what we've been trying to do over the last, uh, probably the last 12 months really, um, and uh, is, is, is a work in progress is uh, develop a best practice approach to contract management across the council. So that's helping uh, services to improve their contract management uh, arrangements. Um, at the end of this month, we will be rolling out a, a module on the council's e-tendering system that will uh, help with those contract management. It will make sure that contract management arrangements are considered during the procurement process rather than um, as, as an afterthought or after the contract has been awarded. It will act as a as a contract management plan um, for uh, relatively sort of simple and high level, but it, it will act as a contract management plan. Um, and it will also allow access to uh, information that will be useful for contract uh, management reporting uh, within, within the authority. Uh, and then alongside with that, we are expressly uh, including in the uh, constitution that uh, the director of resources is responsible for setting and supporting policy with regard to contract management. So the responsibility for day-to-day -day contract management will still be with the services, but um, the constitution uh, currently doesn't deal with contract management uh, and it will do uh, in terms of uh, Neil Evans being responsible for, for setting uh, that policy. Uh, we'll also provide training and guidance to help services uh, and help them develop skills within the services uh, to be more commercial uh, and better able to manage their contracts. So that was that was all I wanted to pick up in terms of the report. But any questions, happy to receive them. Yeah, thank you very much. I, th I think um, what I what I get from the report is, is there's lots to do still to get where we want to to be in terms of managing contracts. I guess there's um, there's a question about um, in, in my mind anyway. How do we review the asks in procured contracts, which I, I don't think is. Um, is is explained clearly in report or how we're going to audit um as it that contract management is happening going forwards once this new module comes out so in terms of the new module and how we will uh monitor that because it's on the our, our e-procurement system we're able to make sure that for each new contract that's uh we're going out to to tender that is uh uh, needs to go on the system so that's anything about ten thousand uh, pounds that the contract management management module has been completed so all that information about how the contract is going to be managed what those uh key requirements of the contract are who the contract manager will be all the information about um who the important contacts are uh from the supplier uh we will be able to report on that and so what i'd anticipate doing is uh certainly for the first maybe six or 12 months reporting monthly to directorates uh, as to which uh, contract, because I think there'll be a bit, a bit of time for them to get used to it and to be making sure that they are doing it. And what I don't want to do is sort of put a blocker on awarding the contract uh, in the first instance, um, because like I say, it will take a bit of time to, to, to get used to it. But what I will be doing is reporting, like I say, each month to directorates as to the numbers of, or percentages of contracts that have completed the module. Um, in terms of, um, sorry, what was the first question? Uh, reviewing the asks in contracts that are being procured. So in terms of reviewing the asks, the contracts, um, typically we'd uh, have contracts between say three and five years. 
uh, they're in place. And obviously, if you if you sort of look back three years, the, the world's a, a bit of a different place that, than it was then. So things do change. Um, within uh, procurement commercial services, um, we are looking to uh, provide support to uh, services to review their contracts. We're starting with the top 20 contracts in terms of value um, to make sure that they've got appropriate contract management arrangements in place and to make sure that they're doing at least an annual review of those uh, contract requirements. Uh, and that's something that is also picked up in the contract management module that um, they need to register each year that they uh, the service has undertaken that annual review of their contracts and their requirements under the contract. And again, if they don't do that, that will sort of raise a red, red flag in terms of the contracts and that will be reported. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in Councillor Lennox next. Thank you. Um, I know that um, this is something that might cross cross the uh, different streams of boards, but something that I know that the inclusive growth um, work has, has looked at is making contracts that do go out to tender more accessible to smaller local providers. And there was some discussion about whether that comes, whether that's um, in the form of some sort of pack to assist people who are obviously smaller um, organizations to apply for those contracts. And it's just something I wanted to flag up here that if this is going to, you know, as this moves forward, um, some sort of consideration of how, of how we can potentially give those contracts um, or, or encourage those contracts to go to smaller Leeds based or Yorkshire based organisations rather than necessarily the great big national organisations who have people specifically employed to write these, you know, these bids for these, these tenders and stuff like that. It's just a really um, important point of I know that I know that is going forward in the inclusive growth stream, which I think is also relevant to how, how contracts and tendering is, is looked at in this board as well. Thank you. I think that's a comment. Comment, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Firth next. If you want to ask all your questions to start with, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, and echoing the point that Councillor Annex made, I think it's absolutely critical because of the fact that uh, obviously, although our overall spend is increasing, the fact is that, as I mentioned before, the number of local suppliers unfortunately has decreased at the same time. But I appreciate there are a number of, of factors in relation to uh, the wider Leeds picture. Um, I just wanted to ask one particular thing in terms of looking at emphasising the role of, of and importance of good contract management within each department. Obviously, we've got a module now to make it more robust, to make sure that we've got that situation. Can you give us a bit more meat on the bone about how we've arrived at that point uh, because of the fact that we obviously want to emphasise what has happened in the past to make sure we don't miss those opportunities because we're not starting at year zero now. We are an organisation that's been contract managing for decades, if not longer than that. And as a result, why is it now that we're now taking that action and gladly making it more robust going forward? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think it's important to say that uh, there, there are some really, really good examples of contract management across the council. Um, but we had, um, well, I, I suppose from a personal perspective, I, I've been a, um, a, aware that, um, you know, there are there are areas that, that sort of get reported through to PACs where issues have arisen and uh, they've arisen because of poor contract management in, in certain circumstances. Uh, and then last year we invited uh, the LGA to uh, facilitate a, a, a review of procurement, a peer review of procurement. Uh, and one of the um, recommendations from that was that, again, they uh, identified that there are uh, examples of, of really good contract management, uh, but what we didn't have was consistent uh, uh, best practice contract management across the council. So one of the recommendations was that, that we ought to uh, develop that. So that's you know, really why, why there's been the, the, the big focus. Uh, and also, I guess, in the context of, of the council's financial challenge, um, we've worked, I think, hard uh, over the years to try and reduce sort of the unit prices uh, that, that we get through procurement. Um, but where I think there is still scope to, to improve things is to review how contracts are actually used. Um, and and in, in the context of that, that percentage that I was talking about earlier in, in terms of what poor contract management can cost, in the context of the council's overall external spend, that's that's quite a huge figure, nine percent. Uh, thank you very much, Kieran. And I, I think your point about being open and having a peer 
review from another authority is really good practice as well. Um, do you have a follow up, Councillor Firth? No. Okay. I'm going to move on to Councillor Burke. Thanks, Chair. Can I ask? The report obviously is focused on contract management and um, Councillor Lennox's comments about inclusive growth, I think, are particularly relevant because what I was going to, the obvious omission from this for me is the pre contracting due diligence. Because obviously one area feeds into the other, doesn't it? So if robust due diligence is done prior to, because I know when I'm looking at the indemnities and the types of things, hopefully nobody will ever have to pay them because quite shocking. Um, but due diligence that would um, prevent, it almost reduces the need to contract manage. And I've got that in inverted commas for obvious reasons. But it would actually, if it's done properly, encourage smaller organisations to um, to compete. They may not have, you know, a bank balance of five million pounds, but um, it doesn't mention. Or apologies if I've missed it. I don't think I have the actual pre procurement and contracting due diligence that should look at organisations rather than prior business and and the, the core outputs perhaps in terms of employing disabled people, apprentices, and how it ties into other <coughs> council strategies. Thank you. Uh, yes, certainly in terms of um, you know, tenders uh, that we receive, we do undertake sort of thorough due diligence with regard to those contracts, uh, sorry, the, 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 the uh, bids that, that are coming in uh, and the evaluation of those. Um, we brought a report, I think it was back in February, about uh, trying to um, use uh, sort of evaluation as, as an opportunity to, to leave a more social value in. And, and part of that includes uh, providing opportunities for people uh, sort of with disabilities or, or, or from uh, sort of relatively uh, you know, deprived socioeconomic backgrounds, things like that. So, so that does that that does get factored into to, to the overall evaluation. As I say, it's tried to encourage uh, encourage those types of opportunities, um, and we can re refer back to the report from February. That's helpful and, and, and provide that again. Thank you, Newman. Yeah, thank you. And I I did reread the report from February actually before today, but I think as part of the um, contract management. Um, it's two sides, isn't it? And the actual contract awarding is the bit in the middle. So it's a very robust, taking the things that February's um, report mentioned, it's the bit before and then the evaluation um, after, which is equally as important, isn't it? So perhaps that evaluation, and I know you're saying you're going to report and feedback, but it's robust evaluation, isn't it? And based on that evaluation, that should have a bearing on whether that contract continues, whether that money is taken back and so on and so forth. But again, that links back to a due diligence exercise before. And I agree about the social enterprise and things that we talked about in February, but this report doesn't actually dig down into that, even taking into account the, um, the contracting, sorry, the report from February. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, the report uh, is, is focused on the terms and conditions that we put in place, and and, and then how we manage those. So, yeah, it, it doesn't sort of deal with that um, the, the phase beforehand in terms of how we uh, actually go out and procure. It does have the background information about the processes that are needed to be followed. But if you if you want some, you want, you want me to focus that on that in a future report, then I'd be happy to do that. You are coming back in December in any case. Just I see Victoria wants to comment as well. And I'll bring you back, Councillor Beck. Can, can I just say we've had um, an LGA peer review um, of procurement and um, the actual um, contracts award signed, et cetera, was um, held up as best practice. The contract management side was where we needed to do a bit more work. And that's why those reports are coming to you um, because we know that we've got really good around where, how we award the contracts, the compliance around that. Um, and making sure that we adhere to the, um, the procurement rules, the contract procurement rules that we have to comply with. So I think that side of it um, 
when we had that peer review, really emphasised that 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 we were up to good practice on that. It was this area on the contract management that we needed to imp improve, and that's why that paper's come today. Okay, thank you. I just want to stress, I wasn't suggesting that it, it didn't take place or there was anything untoward. It's just that it's not detailed for us as a scrutiny board. And the other reason I think it's important, because quite often in communities, there is um, a level of distrust, a level of suspicion about why certain organisations um, are awarded certain contracts. And it's important that we can allay that those suspicions, isn't it? And it's only by being able to say, well, contracts are awarded based on X, Y, Z. And this full due diligence that we can do that, because I think that's really important that we can. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Barry. I'll take that last uh, point as a comment, if that's okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Flynn next. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Um, just a couple of things, uh, Kieran. Uh, could, could you bring us up to date on where we are on the peer review to recommendations uh, from last year? Uh, you've touched on the social value fund, which is on the next exec board agenda. Well, I wonder if you could also um, just expand on how, what that's going to mean uh, for procurement for us, if, if it's passed, of course. Um, comment on the what I think is a relatively low savings in percentage terms over the last next two or three years uh, for a fairly large spend uh, and the last one if you're not entirely up to date but not sort of too concerned it's the it's a key decision uh, regarding transformation project and looking i think at the it systems for procurement Uh, okay, so in terms of the peer review and the recommendations, it, in total, I think, well, so there, there was uh, nine recommendations that, that we took forward, but it was broken down into about 25 or 30 different actions. Um, I do have a report that I'm providing to Corporate Governance and Audit Committee in July. Okay. Could I share that with board so that you can see an update on that? Okay. Um, in terms of the social value fund, uh, the idea behind this fund is to use the council's uh, procurement uh, and the value of the council's procurement spend uh, as a lever to uh, generate uh, income for the, for the council that will be used towards supporting uh, community initiatives uh, and other sort of social value. Um, in order to uh, Bid for account. Well, I suppose in terms of what what the uh, social value fund is, it's asking for uh, a contribution from uh, well anybody basically, uh, but but really uh, potential suppliers or, or suppliers to the council, uh, and that contribution will be based on the um, sort of the size of the organisation, uh, but also the uh, the type of organisation it is. So. Um, uh, and also the location. So for, for voluntary sector organizations or, or micro organizations in Leeds, uh, they wouldn't have to make a contribution, but they'd still be certified uh, under, the, under the social value fund. Uh, for uh, SMEs in Leeds, there's a relatively minor contribution. I think it's around about 250 pounds, something like that. But then you get to uh, large businesses uh, outside Leeds um, and they would have to pay a large amount. I think it's about a thousand pounds is, is, is the suggestion. Um, into the into the social value fund um, for making that contribution uh, the organization will be certified and then when they come to bid for a, a council contract they would get an evaluation benefit so uh, uh, around one or two percent we've not quite settled on precisely what the number is uh, towards the overall evaluation to try and encourage uh, the, the, them to uh, make that contribution and, and be certified um, and then for any uh, council contracts continuing uh, and maintaining that certification so uh, continue to pay into the social value fund each year will, will also be a requirement but at those sort of levels reflecting the type of organization and the size of the organization um, in terms of benefits to those uh, businesses as well that, that are making those contributions they will get a listing on the council's website so there is some value there because uh, there's about i think in terms of traffic about a million people access the council's website each month uh, and so the businesses that make contributions will get a backlink to their website so there is like i said there is some 
uh, benefit in, in that regard. And they probably spend more on, on that kind of uh, access to, to that number of people than you know the than the contribution or, or 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 perhaps broadly equivalent. So there are some benefits there. Uh, so we think it would actually be uh, quite an attractive thing uh, for businesses. And as I say, it's scaled so that um, it, it you know it should encourage actually and be more beneficial to smaller uh, leads based businesses. Coming back to some of the points that were made earlier about trying to encourage them to tender for contracts. Um, was there anything else on the social value fund? Only in the sense that um, is there a danger it will just inflate the you know the, the the bids that come in, or does it not make any difference in the grand scheme of things? I think in the grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't make much difference. Like I say, in terms of the uh, sort of local suppliers, it's a relatively nominal amount. Uh, in terms of those larger uh, external suppliers, they'll be tendering for contracts at a value that uh, means all a thousand a thousand pounds is you know. Uh, not a nominal amount in the context of the overall contracts that they're pitching for. It's not huge. Um, so we think that um, it, it's something that shouldn't increase uh, the, the costs, but we can certainly keep an eye on that and, and, and make sure that um, if there is any, any problems that the, we're reviewing the, uh, the, those values in terms of how much uh, the contribution should be. Um, with regard to uh, savings, um, we did set uh savings targets uh, uh and i think the savings targets that you're talking about are sort of corporate targets each of the directorates will also have their own targets and some of those will be achieved through procurement savings so it's probably worthwhile noting that um i mentioned earlier as well in in, in terms of uh unit prices you know we have worked hard over the last few years to try and uh, get the unit price for you know for what we're buying down as, as low as possible under all our contracts. Uh, we're seeing uh, inflationary pressures have an impact on suppliers and, and sort of coming back and asking us to, to review those prices. So in terms of uh, making savings through the actual procurement itself, I think that's going to become more and more difficult. But I, I think the, the, the opportunity is looking at how we use those contracts. And I think that's why contract management is really uh, important thing for us to, to 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 get better at over the next uh, year or two. Um, and then you mentioned about transformation as well. Um, I mean, I talked earlier about having the you know the the amount of manual work that has to go into getting the information with regard to things like local spend and and spend with SMEs um, and you know the systems that we've got in place with regard to financial management are, are you know old and, and, and a bit creaky. So in terms of the um, core business transformation pro, uh, program to, uh, to, to, to have integrated systems where you can, where you can pull off the data, that, that will help management reporting so much. Um, yeah, Councillor Flynn, do you want to follow up? Yeah, really on the point you were making about um, savings being made by individual directorates aren't really shown in the figures that you actually produce. It, I'm not suggesting you should do this, but it would be handy to know um, overall how much savings we're making in um, procurement, uh, because against a budget of a billion pounds or thereabouts, I know it's capital and revenue and all the rest of it, um, the savings you actually project in the financial monitoring don't look particularly uh, ambitious. Um, but that's just a comment, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Flynn. Okay, I'm going to bring in Councillor Renshaw next, please. Thank you, Chair. I think most of my things have been covered, but I'll expand on it slightly. I just wondered if there were going to be any flexibility and changes incorporated within the contracts that could be addressed, and um, the impact specifically with the cost of living crisis and inflation, and what impact that would have on the service as a whole, and obviously it's to the council so i didn't know if you could answer those please yeah sorry when, when you talked about flexibility what, what were you thinking about in particular sorry obviously with the development with throughout the city it impacts on many services that are delivered in different areas and i just wonder if there'd be flexibility so that once that have an increased demand of will be able to project 
early on, probably what that expansion will have and whether there'll be any flexibility in the way some services are delivered. Um, I know in, particularly in my ward, there's been areas that have been omitted from specific services because that wasn't there initially and then it needs to be built in. So, and that must happen citywide. So I just wonder if you could expand on that slightly. Yeah, so the, um, there is the opportunity to uh, vary contracts to, to a degree. Um, if you're talking about particularly high value contracts and high value changes, then um, procurement regulations um, kind of put a block on that. Um, so that you have to go out and procure a new contract if, if that's the case. But in terms of uh, that, that sort of flexibility that you talk about, I think that, that, that comes down to what I was mentioning earlier with regard to those uh, continual reviews of, of, of contracts. Uh, services should be keeping uh, under review uh, the requirements of contracts. And if there are changes, like you say, in, in communities, if there are new developments or things like that where the services need to be expanded, then that should be reflected. And like I say, they do have the scope to be able to. So if there are additional services need to be provided in a particular new area, then there is scope to amend the contract to, to, to build those in. If for whatever reason they can't do that, then we'll go out and procure a new contract. But they definitely do need to be uh, keeping that under review. And I think the contract management uh, module that we're putting in place will uh, make sure that those reviews, like I say, are taking place at least annually. Uh, and uh, we'll be able to provide support in undertaking those those kind of reviews. Thank you, Chair. Just for reassurance, will that be built into the procurement that contracts? Because quite often things cannot be changed because the contract is, say, for, for example, three years, and so it's not been able to be changed. Will that be incorporated within that to ensure that there's that flexibility there? Yeah, I mean, we should always be able to to vary contracts. Um, as long as the contract's operating, like I say, we, we can make changes to them. I, I think, um, you know, potentially what you might have come across is, is services saying, you know, we, we can't make the change because either we don't have the funding or because it's, you know, we're asking the contractor to do something slightly different or provide more than something that than we originally went out to procure. So there might be practical difficulties, but in terms of the, the principle of, of can we vary the contract and is there flexibility there to do it, then there should be. Um, so I guess I, I'd say if, if you were experiencing any particular concerns or problems with, with particular services or particular contracts, then you know, by all means do let me know and I'm happy to look at it because that, that flexibility should be there. Yeah, it just quite concerns me as well with the cost of living crisis and the price of um, inflation. So obviously there's going to be a lot of impact on contractors and the like what's already been mentioned, I think, about the projected figures for that. And will there be a cap on that or will it be like upwards of? So in terms of the council standard position when it comes to contracting, uh, we ask for a fixed price and we don't typically building inflationary mechanisms. There are some contracts that do have inflation already built in, but but uh, on the vast majority of them don't have any inflation built in. Um, what we are finding, though, is that a lot of contract, well, uh, a number of contracts uh, are coming to us saying, look, we, we can't continue to provide the service at, at this cost. And, and in that case, um, it's essentially a negotiation uh, as to whether um, we think that uh, a, a price increase would be appropriate uh, and we support services to, 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 to do that. Um, and then, of course, you know, when the contract comes to expire, uh, there's the opportunity to sort of bid at, at, at the new prices. Um, but yes, we are, we are experiencing some contractors coming back saying that they, they want to look at prices again. Thank you, Kieran. OK, Councillor France Mayor. Good morning. Um, just referring back to your report where you've um, where you talk, where you've mentioned about inadequate performances where um, contractors 
that um, contractors have delivered. Is there a snagging period or an extended snagging period for where they've carried out the work to see if there's any further det um, deterioration or additional damage that has been done to any properties throughout the seasons that you might not be able to pick up immediately or within the, the first three months? Thank you. So is this specifically relating to uh, repairs to council houses? Well, council houses or where there's been, where, um, sorry, I'm just thinking top of my head, where there's council houses, but where there's been um, like a room put downstairs for additional needs and so on. Yeah, could, could I ask if you've got a specific concern, if you would, if you, if you want to send it to me directly and I'm happy to, to look into it and, and pick up with colleagues in housing or, or, or LBS, uh, as, as a general uh, point, I mean, I mean, we've got so many different contracts that, that deal with, uh, you know, different uh, areas and services. Um, I, I think typically in terms of how we manage contracts, I'd expect that there is a degree of, uh, you know, an opportunity to, to, to mobilise and, 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 and get things up to speed at, at the outset of a contract. And we might be a little bit more... Um, not relaxed. That's not quite the right word, but 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 we might be more accepting of, of underperformance while the service gets up to speed. Um, but we should always be actively managing the contracts, and if there is underperformance at any point in time, engaging with the with the supplier to try and make sure that um, that whatever the issue is, that that's resolved promptly, and that we are getting what we pay for. But but as I say, if you've got a specific issue with a particular contract that, that you're concerned about, if you do want to email me, then I'm I'm happy to pick that up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, I can't see anyone else indicating. So I'm going to move on to the next item. Thank you very much for your time, Kieran. Okay, so the next um, two items kind of go together because it's sort of a work in the work programme. Um, and so I think, I think it's probably worth taking them kind of together, if that's okay. Um, as you'll know, the, on item 12, there's the, the proposed work programme. Some of the stuff we've already talked about is going to be coming up already this meeting. Um, sorry, we've discussed in this meeting, it's going to be coming up in future meetings. Um, I don't know if, Becky, you want to make any comments before I open for comments. Thank you. Um, no, if, if we're taking them together, Chair, the only thing I would particularly draw the board's attention to, obviously, as well as reviewing the, the draft work schedule in full, is the statement of evidence, um, the statement in relation to the zero tolerance approach to racism, which it would be helpful if the board could give their approval so that could be passed on to the executive member on your behalf. Yeah, OK, so I'll take, I'll take that first. Are there any comments on that statement? Yes, Councillor Burke. I have my post, it's actually ready. Okay, I read the uh, statement following our prior meeting, and I think um, perhaps there was a misunderstanding um, regarding what was actually said. Because I'm from memory, my colleagues, I think, actually said that. Um, they will always look for ACAS to intervene prior to any um, court action. But going back to this statement, there's a couple of questions. So I'm not sure who I'd address them to because it's only us now, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so the statement is this board's opinion. Uh, okay. uh, and I guess it's it's difficult for... Um, we're on page... On, on my part, we're on page 181, but we're around there. There's a statement... Um, and we discussed this in detail. The, the idea of this statement is to formalise some of the conversations we had in a, the, the previous board had, which obviously myself and Councillor Burke were both on. Um, and just to um, reassure uh, board members, this has been seen by the, um, I know Councillor Burke doesn't like the term BAME network, but that's what they're still still call themselves so they've seen it and are, are comfortable with it um and and the idea is this um will inform decision making and again the idea is if we can make a comment before formal decisions are make, made that's how we can have influence but if you've got questions or this is clearly our board statement so uh 
crack on let's have a discussion okay well it's probably a combination of comment and question so I'll, I'll leave you to decipher which is which um when you look at it it says there's for me i interpret this as a reliance on others to identify and support because what this is actually doing in a nutshell is saying that um, any incidences should be dealt with sort of disciplinary procedure rather than a grievance but actually you can't disentangle the two because grievance is part of the disciplinary procedure so that's but there's the huge reliance on here because it doesn't go far enough so i was interested what our colleague said this morning about the person who's going to act as a buffer for people to go to so perhaps that could be mentioned in here if that's the case because that would obviously link into this it's it's closely linked but discrimination will span more than one protected characteristic in some occasions. There are also incidences of discrimination where people have suffered as a result of a prior case. This takes no account of, of those incidences and it places a huge reliance on somebody to A, spot it or B, take action. When actually, and it does say, of course, people can still put a grievance in but I think it's kind of diluting that and it could actually lead in my opinion to the council being held vicariously liable because if if they they take or don't take the right action there is a, a there is an element of vicarious liability in there so I think as well this perhaps should talk more about the informal routes prior to grievance which would tie in with all ACAS recommendations doesn't mention it, it just kind of launches into we'll follow the disciplinary action. But actually, people should be encouraged to go down the informal route. And that would certainly be endorsed by ACAS and the other recognised bodies. Um, there should be a policy link, a clear policy link to disciplinary um, policy. And perhaps it should include... Uh, deadlines and best practice um, as a last resort. But just to clarify that that first statement, um, you should only go to a tribunal if you've tried their cast conciliation, not if you've not followed the internal grievance procedure. I've said a lot there, haven't I? <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Councillor. But what, what I would just say uh, back is that this is this is not policy. Um, it's not intended to be a policy, um, and most of it reflects what was said at the, the previous meeting. If you've got, a, a, in terms of a wording proposal change, I guess what I'm nervous about doing, Councillor Burke, is if we if we leave it till the next meeting, and which I'm not completely against, just means that it's longer before um, sort of our advice as a, a board is um, is formalised. Thank you, Chair. I don't, um, I don't actually think it does accurately reflect the conversation we had at the last board. And I think the um, points raised are really important. So happy to, to write that and send it to yourself. And... Councillor Firth. Thank you, Chair. I just want to say also, I do, I do think that it is, it is important to emphasise the discussion between uh, the BAME uh, group of council workers and also two councillors here about the discrepancy in terms of that. And I think Councillor Burke's right to bring that up. Um, I, I do, as was emphasised in that meeting, uh, and I appreciate I'm not um, of the, in the BAME category, I think it was emphasised quite widely across the board about the emphasis of the fact that major organisations across the country are uh, are of trying to avoid, including the BBC, among others, using the term BAME because it is effectively homogenising a very diverse group and making sure that actually we're not fully evaluating how individuals from each of those different parts for different minorities and different diverse backgrounds are actually being reflected in the council and how we're actually supporting them as best we can. Um, and I think we're also to emphasise that certainly um, I would hope that in the future we, we find another way of uh, reflecting that in our reports. Uh, uh, but also I would also, one thing that was mentioned when Councillor Burke raised 
the freedom to speak up guardian I, I just really wondered whether colleagues can provide any more meat in the bone about the role in which that's going to play in terms of also how is that going to affect the role of the trade unions within the council uh, and also more generally in terms of making sure that we have the best route for individuals to feel they have the ability to whistleblow on anything that they uh, or raise any issues that they may have thank you chair Thank you, Councillor Firth. I guess in terms of the uh, Speak Up Guardian, I think Andy uh, Dobson, when he's here, was the right person to ask. I, I certainly can't comment on it, um, exactly what his vision is. Um, and I think he, he's, he talked about um, NHS practice. So, I mean, that would have been an, an interesting question. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the BAME staff network, um, I don't think it's our job as a board to be telling a staff network what they should call themselves. And so until such time as they change their own name, which they're entitled to do, um, I presume at any time, um, I, I don't think we can we can call them in any, anything else. I think that would be um, inappropriate for us to do so. Um, in terms of the comments that Councillor Burke's made, I, th I think, and, and, and yourself, Councillor Firth, I'm happy to um, ask Becky to uh, liaise with Councillor Burke and you as well, Councillor Firth, for um, comments and amendments. Um, and then we'll, we'll consider the best way to take that forward in terms of um, moving this agenda forwards. I think, I think the, the, the key from my perspective is, is to make sure that those policy setters, including um, executive board, are really conscious of this issue and make sure they keep it high on their priority so our staff um, feel as, um, as included as they possibly can. Uh, Councillor Burke, do you want to comment again? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy with that, Andrew. I just would add one last comment. The government, and if you look on gov.uk, I, I think you're absolutely right that we shouldn't and we, we can't dictate to what individual groups call themselves. But government directive is that we don't use the term BIRM. BIRM. So perhaps whilst we can't dictate, we should strongly suggest that government guidelines say this. And if we are looking at a new way forward, then perhaps we need to look at complying with government guidelines. But happy to perhaps work together or, or, or get some words to you. OK, thank you very much. Any other comments on this specific item? So on this uh, policy, zero tolerance, okay. Let's move on to the work programme. Any comments on the work programme? Yep, Councillor Carly. Thanks, Chair. Um, got a couple of bits. One is just from um, the bits picked up today. The second is just a couple of bits, because obviously I chaired the previous meeting of this before in your absence, and I was just going to ensure that all the points we picked up there had, had been captured. Um, first thing then is just looking at the, within the sources of work, um, my role previously was working in a behaviour change agency. Um, so the area of co-production and co-creation is something that is of interest to me, but it is quite often a term that that is misunderstood and isn't done well, shall we say. Um, in the pages, uh, it's page 97 of, of my pack, the Our Team Leads approach. There's a lot around co-production, co-design, um, co um, how we shift power to citizens and communities. Um, uh, and then that leads into the discussion around consultation as a whole and how we consult on on various schemes across different areas. I think I've raised this before once and, and, and I, I can't remember the exact answer that we got, but is there an overall strategy or a department that advises across the directorates on, on how we consult with um, the population of leads? Because I think I've seen from a number of areas we do consultations very differently in different services. Not all of them are done as well as we'd want and not all of them get necessarily the um, level of response we'd get. Now, obviously, some scrutiny boards could look at individual consultations within some um, services that they look at, but the overall idea of how we consult with people, certainly on the bigger strategies, I wondered whether that's anything we can have a conversation around or, or whether there are people in the council that look at that as a whole or whether they're embedded in services. So I think that's a really fascinating question. I think particularly around some of the work we did last year, 
in terms of the contact center and how letters they're sent out maybe sometimes leave questions unanswered and then result in large amounts of contact to the contact center and it's it's almost i feel like it's linked to that how do we communicate with the public both in terms of what we're saying to the public but also when we're saying what do you want to say back to us because communication only works if it's both ways you know so, so I, I think that's a really valid point so i i cut you off did you have other comments no yeah well just add into that yeah, i think i've seen consultation done in several different ways in different areas we can choose different consultative approaches so we had the climate jury for instance which was a way to deal with incredibly difficult issues with a representative view of the population but then there's some i've seen in um uh, in the highway side where we've modernized the way we consult and we had to switch to the online side during the pandemic because big public meetings weren't available but then actually we did a lot of work going into communities with um uh with support from the third sector and actually knocking on doors and speaking to people and the results we got when you knock on a range of doors and your ward is one of them that we've been in the results you get when you knock on a range of doors and speak to everyone are very different from the amount of people that turn up to a particular event or or visit something online so i, I just think it's very interesting that in my view that could mean we're getting the wrong response to a consultation in some areas um and, and it's something that always needs uh, amending so uh, that was my 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 one um uh, point from my own side uh, then looking into the things we raised before now i know 2023 is coming back um and it referenced a couple of ideas in in the work program what we're talking about i just wanted to make sure uh, one of the things people had a clear view on was the grants and the job opportunities that were available through 2023 and ensuring that they were um communicated effectively and at the right level for organizations and individuals within our communities to get them so to make sure they did go to the people that we would want those jobs to go to um so that was one and there was a point around the legacy of 2023 and us being able to see early on what the the hope was of of that legacy um so that we can better scrutinize it later um and then there was some discussion about community centers in that one and, and a we weren't sure whether the idea of the business plan and uh, the council's investment into community centres and the spend came under this board or uh, it came under communities and environments. So just a clarification on that. Other than that, there's a the couple of things that I brought up earlier in the board. So the gender split in different services and departments. Um, the health of the cultural industries in the city for facing where we've been, which could be tied in perhaps to the Leeds 2023, but it's a wider um, view. Um, I, th I think that was it, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, Becky might just have a comment on. Um, just to say on the, the first points regarding um, Leeds 2023, I will feed those back through to, to Eve, who's coordinating that. The, the initial feedback had gone through to them, but I will re-emphasise that to make sure those points are picked up. On the community centres, that actually falls to um, EH Environment, Housing and Communities Board. So we have checked that and it's not within the remit of this board. It would, it would fall to Councillor Anderson's board. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring Councillor Firth next. Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to add to Councillor Carlisle's point. I think it's absolutely critical about consultation. We had a, a major consultation on the A64 at the same time as a major consultation by WICA on a very similar issue, and it actually conflated uh, the consultations and the response to them was actually less than a major, much smaller in the, generating the view uh, of a much smaller consultation. And I just wondered whether actually that may be something that might be useful to bring up uh, within the the September board to do a devolution because of the role between WICA and the council, because that conflation meant that both consultations were really poorly responded to and led to a lot of confusion among residents, particularly in our part, of, uh, particularly in East and Northeast Leeds. And that was a, an issue going forward. I think that related to that on devolution, I just wanted to ask the purpose of that particular meeting it is one year on. Is there any possibility that we're going to have Tracy Brabin as the mayor available? If not, what sort of scrutiny? I understand that Wakefield have had an open council meeting with the mayor. What sort of scrutiny is looking forward for the mayor more generally in terms of our board going forward? And also potentially making sure that we have senior individuals like Ben Still and others available at that meeting to understand how that relationship is going forward. So I just wondered if you had more meat on the bone about what that will entail and uh, some suggestions there. Thank you. 
just in terms of the consultation, I think there's a there's an issue around consultation fatigue. I think that definitely happens and also a lack of clarity on who's responsible for what. So you talk about in my ward, we have the um, M621 and that is Highways England. And I, I can't do anything about that. And it's that understanding that, that's almost linking together. Um, so I take that. Uh, Becky, do you have just um, some information on the devolution item? Yeah, just to provide um, reassurance, I suppose, that we are going through the Mayor's office at the moment. The intention is to have both um, Ben and the, and the Mayor or a representative, I guess, um, here, if at all possible. Yeah, I think more, more broadly, I think it's clearly an important item. But I think there's a, certainly from my perspective, the recognition of um, the reality is our scrutiny board doesn't have a statutory authority in the same way we do in lead city council items. It's important to give us an opportunity to talk and, and challenge, but I think we've got to recognise the, the statutory difference between us as a scrutiny board for lead city council and us as a scrutiny board interested in what, what the mayor's doing. Um, but you can come back. Thank you, Chair. No, I, I think it's really just to understand going forward, given that other authorities are having a, a, some sort of scrutiny directly involved in terms of how that will play out here. And maybe that's further investigation elsewhere. I, I also think that a lot of colleagues on both sides today and in previous meetings have emphasised the role of looking at the whole of the Leeds picture, uh, be it from trying to get local suppliers to bid for our contracts all the way through to helping the wider Leeds and West Yorkshire economy. And therefore, as a result, even though I appreciate that the statutory role of our committee is different to that of what maybe we want to scrutinise but I think that certainly the question can still be asked about whether they'd be willing to attend and I but I appreciate your comments. Uh, the one thing I was also going to say is in terms of the September meeting given that that is such a big item um, the electoral services update has obviously been something that I've raised a number of times particularly in relation to the fact that also has not been mentioned there was the proposal of the 2023 uh, uh, blah, 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 polling district review rather than the 2023 boundary review as well um, and so I think that we certainly just want to make sure that we have enough time within that meeting given that we don't want to effectively uh, speak ourselves out of time to not be able to review it and scrutinise the stuff that comes up. Uh, thank you I just also just add on in terms of the the mayor attending meetings when I was uh, chair of corporate governance audits we recommended in terms of the process that the mayor should come to full council to answer questions. Um, and so that's the recommendation I made then, and I, I stand behind that, that recommendation. Uh, but thank you for your comments. Okay, I'm going to uh, bring in Councillor Flynn next. Uh, it's really just to echo uh, the point about uh, consultation. Um, I, 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 having looked at a number of these things in some detail, I, I've little doubt that the council actually follows the process that's laid down for consultation, but it's whether the consultation is actually effective or not, uh, because you get a very, very small response by and large anyway, even to very large ones. Um, I mean, just referring to taxis as a matter of interest, you've all seen hundreds of drivers outside here time and time and time again. And that was allegedly because of a flawed consultation process three or four years ago, which we've been told repeatedly was carried out in exactly the same way as it should have been. Um, or the proper way it should have been. So I think we need to look more at the detail of, 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 of how we actually do consultations rather than just doing them willy-nilly, uh, but that will come, I'm sure. Second one is, um, I mentioned strategic, strategic reviews, business as usual, savings. Um, I noticed that we only got two further looks at, the, at financial monitoring uh, between now and the end of the year, uh, one in, I think, November, one in January. Um, uh, it doesn't give us an awful lot of time to look at uh, those issues in between time because I've looked at all the items, none of them are really looking at the at the budget looking ahead. Although I know we've got, I think, an off the off the wall budget meeting, haven't we? And maybe I don't know when they are, Becky. Do you know? It's one later in the year, I know. Do you know? Yeah. It's all right. I'll, I'll dig it up myself. Hi, Councillor Flynn. Sorry. 
sorry, I'm no, 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 it's just to say that's yet to be determined and it, it um, what will influence the scheduling of that working group is when the proposals come through the executive board process so officers aren't sure yet at what point in the autumn those will, will sort of come through the machine and so we can't we can't work out the sort of publishing arrangements with scrutiny until we know that as a starting point. Sorry, that's a bit of a sort of bureaucratic response, but as soon as we know, we'll be able to get that in diaries. Yes, there's, there's a financial monitoring paper goes to the executive board every month. Uh, so we, we know sort of in advance, well, we won't know in advance until the papers come out, but they don't come out until the fortnight, I think before the executive board is due. So uh, it's really something to think about, I think, because I, I'm very interested in budget plans um, and, and what they mean in terms of service to the public uh, and, and, and what the adverse effects of them are going to be. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Finn. There, there is a real, um, a real challenge in terms of how many meetings you have and how many work items you have. Um, but I take on board your, your comments. I know you've talked to me offline as well about the importance of uh, financial monitoring. Um, does anyone else want to comment? Out? Councillor Firth does. I'll bring you in next. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make a, a separate point, which I raised at a previous meeting, which is that um, obviously we brought the start time of this committee meeting forward to allow for other meetings for, for colleagues and for exec members, for officers. I, I just want to stress that in the future, I hope that certainly going forward, we can emphasise that also for all that they're able to stay for their items as well. I appreciate that people have conflicting diaries, but it means that then potentially we're not able to scrutinise those particular roles when we don't have as many meetings during the year as maybe we'd like because of simply time. Um, so I just wonder whether that could be fed back as a, a point that has been raised by members previously. Um, thank you, Councillor Firth. Um, yeah, and I'd take that point in the parity of esteem with the executive board that scrutiny has under the, the constitution of the council. I take that, that point. Okay, um, I can't see any more comments. Clearly, I'm happy to talk about the um, work programme offline as well, if anyone's interested. So with that, I'll say thank you very much for everyone for attending. Thanks for your comments and contributions, and I'll see you next.